welcome to pratidwani where we try to humanize science i am your host gv pawan kumar it is my pleasure to introduce you to my guest uh, ranjini bandopadhyay ranjini is a soft condensed matter physicist and uh, she is a professor at uh, raman research institute in bengaluru ranjini did her uh, phd from indian institute of science bengaluru subsequently she was a post doctoral researcher at uh, ucla in california and uh, later on uh, she did another post doctoral stint at uh, johns hopkins university in the usa uh, in year 2005 or so she joined uh, raman research institute and she has been a faculty member ever since ranjini has various different uh, interest in uh, soft matter physics uh, specifically structure dynamics correlation in uh, colloidal suspensions biopolymer gels uh, mixed clay uh, clay is a very fascinating um, soft material she is also very interested in active colloids synthesis of such colloids and also utility in uh, active glasses which is a, itself a very fascinating area of research her lab also has uh, been working on interfacial instabilities which looks at uh, fluid dynamics at a very small scale uh, roughly about a micron or so which is itself a very fascinating uh, area of research and she is also deeply interested in granular matter and some very fascinating experiments have emerged uh, from her uh, laboratory in recent times in this episode uh, we explored uh, how she became a scientist i was very interested in knowing uh, how she articulates her thoughts Uh, because if you hear ranjini and her uh, research talks they are very interesting and very fascinating and she puts across the point very effectively and i was always interested in knowing a bit more about that and she elaborates very nicely on that particular point i also explored uh, how she really became interested in soft matter physics which is a, as i mentioned a very fascinating area and uh, the kind of training and motivation uh, uh, it needs to become a soft matter physicist and uh, soft matter physics itself is a very uh, uh, interesting area which is close to my own research interest so we had a very interesting discussion about uh, the kind of community soft matter uh, physics is and things like that uh, we also discussed the importance of creativity and ingenuity in such kind of work because it is not a infrastructure intensive uh, pursuit uh, but it requires quite a lot of thought process in designing and uh, also executing experiments which is something which we discussed about uh, specifically in the context of how this area of research is very suitable for uh, indian research community and uh, the interesting aspect it, it actually has a very deep impact on society we also discussed about the impact versus the impact factors of the papers and uh, how one should not uh, confuse the one from the other and uh, there's also a very nice small segment uh, where ranjini uh, describes about her research and motivations in her mother tongue which is bengali and we also uh, discussed a little bit about uh, uh, education and also the pedagogic aspect of uh, learning science in general and how one can keep interest in science which is a very ex- extreme uh, important uh, topic uh, at any any given point of time in a society of course there were many interesting uh, sub discussions which you will also hear as you progress into this particular episode overall it was a fantastic uh, uh, conversation and as usual whenever you talk to ranjini you will learn a lot and also uh, you will get to understand very interesting perspectives in how to do research and uh, other things please also check uh, the uh, show notes which will have links and references related to the conversation which we have and uh, please do share this particular uh, podcast with uh, interested uh, students and anybody who is uh, interested in science so that uh, this particular endeavor uh, gets a little bit more kind of traction in terms of reaching to a lot many people so this is pratidwani where we try to humanize science i am delighted to have ranjini today on uh, pratidwani welcome ranjini uh, i'm i'm so happy that you actually thank you. could come here thank, thank you for having me yeah so ranjini give us a overview of uh, how ranjini became a scientist your background uh, what are the things which motivated you as a as a student uh, while growing up we would be very uh, interested in knowing that yeah. okay as you know i do soft matter where self assembly is a very important thing right i mean things just come together and 
it's our job to figure out why now why i became a self as you know soft matter scientist that's also a bit like a self assembly problem except that i still haven't figured it out even after uh, 30 years so <laughs> yeah so um i can tell you a little bit about you know uh, how i grew up and maybe you know the the reason why i came to like science and chose it as a profession so um, i'm an only child of bengali parents and they want you to be a physicist no matter what and uh, growing up you know i also did well in school and i you know i i, I knew i had to be a scientist it was only much later that i realized that you know my parents had other expectations from me like marriage and so on and so forth but anyways i i did well at school i uh, i did well in my school leaving examination and you know uh, i i wanted to do mathematics at that stage but then an aunt who was a professor at of physics at bribon college uh, talked me into doing physics saying that this is more application oriented so then you know the Uh, the scope later on is much uh, broader and i'm really glad i took that piece of advice and uh, i of course i i did my bsc and msc in physics from uh, jadavpur university then came to uh, came to isc to do a phd where remember these were this was 1995 so this was before browsers and google or anything like that and I remember very clearly that one of the things that I liked from um, MSc was uh, semiconductors and when I came to ISC I really wanted to do semiconductors but then when I came to ISC I could just I just got the vibe that you know soft matter experiments was the way to go and I did it and I, I'm just so glad I did that because even today when I see a bubble in a foam moving under a microscope or you know i mean granular matter that's vibrating you know on a on a mechanical vibrator you know showing us that you can actually change sizes and fluidize a glass a glassy assembly of granular matter i mean you know i just i mean it just makes my uh my life worth it i mean really wonderful wonderful you know it's such a heartening thing to know because uh, a lot of things what we do as part of your of our general observations in in our daily life mm-hmm. has very implication on becoming a scientist especially oh absolutely you know, soft matter is probably tailor made for such kind of uh, oh absolutely so you know because you started me on soft matter so you know it also depends on some really good teachers and i at least you know from my college days i mean there are some teachers that i am you know i'm really honored to have been you know pupils of so in my uh, my undergraduate there was a teacher called ranjan bhattacharya very very enthusiastic very encouraging actually i really you know even i wasn't very sure if i wanted to do research as a career in fact i've even you know applied for interviews in uh, the industry okay? okay and i even got a job well my father wanted me to take the ias examinations and i remember uh, you know the ias examination it clashed with my iisc interview date but then you know professor bhattacharya was the one who told me no go for it you know okay. so yeah so i um, yeah and then of course you know afterwards when i started doing soft matter i was already in ajay sud's lab but i was doing course work there was another fantastic teacher rajaram nityananda Yes. he did statistical mechanics and thermodynamics i'm talking about 95 1995 28 years hence i still have his notes wow yeah, yeah really i mean they are, and you know so these were handwritten notes you don't get them anymore so after yes. every lecture you know he would give you handwritten notes and you know these are basically that's the game changer actually it's a life changer you know and then when i was uh, Uh, you know uh, this is yeah and then in the next semester there was chandan who as you know chandan das gupta another fantastic teacher and you know he kind of you know i was by now i was sure that you know yeah condensed matter is what i wanted to do and now why soft condensed matter because uh, one is you know the interdisciplinarity um, i like the fact how physics chemistry and biology all come together 
right and i i, I learned so many things because chemistry was something that you know i had forgotten about and now i have these fantastic students who are such good chemists you mm-hmm. know we just i just you know i could just speculate that it would be nice if you know we had this particular colloidal uh, you know uh, macromolecule and they make it okay yes. and that makes you know it's so much fun because see most of these materials are also model systems for hard condensed matter systems that you can't quite access because you know so these are really the colloids that we make these are like scaled up atoms right it's difficult to do experiments with atoms but you know because these are like micron sized you can actually see them move under a microscope or you know you can even uh, do simple things like scatter light of them to look at their structure Uh, they are so much easier to uh, study so you can actually you know like treat them as uh, scaled up atoms and you can discover many things and experimentally observe many things okay many features of atomic systems that you wouldn't quite get because it's so hard to experimentally access the structure or dynamics of uh, atomic yeah. systems now th- this is something uh very interesting we would, we are going to expand on this particular theme especially what you are talking about i would uh, revisit this whole thing uh, uh, after a few minutes but before that first and foremost you know i am also a, a big uh, raja ram nityananda fan i had the privilege also to be his colleague in in, in isa pune he was uh, here post his uh, ncra stint and mm-hmm. uh, he teach uh, optics course here and uh, I, you know uh, i i have uh, the book which he gave to me of uh, pancharatnam you know as you know oh, okay. he is okay. an optics person and uh, anybody who has talked to rajaram would would uh, get <laughs> entrenched right. in that. it's uh, i mean even a 5 minute conversation on anything is in- enriching absolutely absolutely mm-hmm. i hope to have him uh, on the on the uh, podcast too at some point of time i i am uh, uh, yeah now oh, uh, uh, ranjini uh, going forward in terms of uh, the way you actually had your uh, kind of education uh, in in kolkata if i if i'm correct mm-hmm. it right. was mainly in kolkata uh, what was the kind of ecosystem in which you kind of uh, grew up uh, at home uh, what was the kind of uh, stuff what you did uh, to to motivate you to go towards science either in terms of reading or in terms of uh, mm-hmm. let's say some other kind of exploration which happens at an engage uh, if you can okay. let us know a little bit about that Okay so I think you know um, I went to a girl school mm-hmm. okay and uh, it was a very good school uh, I, I you know it's very difficult for me to put a finger I mean I liked everything I mean I could have been a historian but like I told you you know okay the other thing was um, I actually grew up with my grandparents because my my dad was a geologist so he used to look for sites to you know build dams on and right. after i went to 7th grade my mother was also traveling with him so i grew up with my grandparents and i was very independent but you know my 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 grandfather was from the military so you know he made sure that you know i would at least sit down to do my homework on time and i of course i really didn't like it at that time but today i'm i'm very grateful because i think discipline is you know something that you do need to do anything Absolutely. you know so because you know in experiments you need to make sure that what you're doing is accurate it takes time you need to reproduce data so unless that that discipline you know that you know that love for you know having systems of in place is you know is internalized i think it's very difficult to you know absolutely do, absolutely right so i think you know that is what i really learned uh you know in my days you know i think that was the most important lesson now what i wanted to do really nobody stopped me and like i told you you know um i did what i wanted uh, but I, and i actually wanted to do math because you know i do like you know doing analytical things and you know puzzles and i've always liked doing it but uh, i got talked into physics by my aunt so but at that time i'm not even sure i was looking at physics as a career in that sense because see this was way before you could really you know things are not so easy then you know going to google and doing a search all i had was one aunt you know mm-hmm. so i really didn't explore very much i just spoke to my aunt and that also you know for a very brief duration and like i told you i had this one professor who was very encouraging and here i am wow wonderful so, wonderful that's that's uh, 
it's always very nice to actually have supportive ecosystem especially uh, in in which you do get a lot of support uh, mm-hmm. I, uh, there is some kind of a boundary within which you would be able to do a lot of things and exactly. uh, while growing up for children that is a, a very very oh important. definitely you know for instance when i come back home you know how much money i get to spend i think my you know my grandparents you know who were elderly but they did a very good you know job at that i think and i think those things are good because i still carry them with me absolutely those yeah. that, those are kind of foundational values which absolutely are- which i find it's i find it very hard for you know my daughter for instance mm-hmm. because you know of course a you know i'm working and you know we get much less time together and you yes. know that we yeah, are that exposure is so much more than you know anything i had been exposed to they are so over exposed i think my under exposure was not a bad thing okay okay <laughs> that that's a interesting way of uh, putting it you, 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 it's very interesting to know that so one of the aspects uh, which i would also want to know is uh, growing up in 90s and uh, getting your education in jadavpur university which mm. has really given us a lot of very good uh, scientists mm-hmm. not only the scientists artists musicians mm-hmm. even uh, great actors and other others mm-hmm. uh, what is that w- what's in the water <laughs> in jadavpur university uh, which uh, okay gave you such an opening i mean you know i would say jadavpur university is a product of a you know i don't want to be you know encourage regionalism in any way but i have to say that you know there is this strong culture of science education in bengal science mm-hmm. education as opposed to you have to be a doctor or you have to be an engineer or you have to be an ias officer so you know even if you go to a you know to a school in uh, in a village you know my father school he grew up in in a village you know the math and science and english actually you know grammar yes Yes. things are done very well absolutely because see it's really done very well i i have observed uh, having listened to your talks and also uh, interacting with you uh, your uh, language exposition is very good mm-hmm. like you know my, but you know bengali was my first language oh wow it was my second uh, language I, yeah because you know i went to i went to an english medium school in that the you know the instruction or you know the medium of instruction was english but then we belong to the west bengal board um, so bengali was my first language but now that i have not used it for a very long time and of course you know i mean in science scientific terms are much easier in english yeah so yeah yeah because it's very clear that you probably had a very good upbringing in terms of uh, uh, speaking in english and also you know communication yes. and other things and That's- uh, Most of the I time, think, I mean, thank you for saying that you know I'm communicating well. But it is true that you know we did have very good exposure to you know very good English teachers. Actually, you know we were in our school at least. Uh, like I said, you know math is already you know quite developed. Yeah. Uh, but in our school, I thought you know the the humanities were very good. I mean most of my peers, for instance, you know. so they actually went into the humanities and where it is much more difficult than in science but they've done so well yes you yes. know so one of my friends you know so she ended up in the indian revenue service and she was auditing rri when i was a young faculty so she was a deputy auditor general by the time you know i i, I just landed a permanent job there was another another uh, friend who's still in the world bank uh somebody who's working in the united nations these are all people who did humanities absolutely absolutely in yeah. fact that is something which is to be strongly encouraged even oh, for absolutely. students who are, who are uh, generally getting trained in science without humanities probably we would we would lose out on a very important component oh absolutely i mean liberal sciences and arts are so necessary necessary absolutely other way around also is important right because somebody should know its second law of thermodynamics <laughs> oh, absolutely <laughs> absolutely yeah so good teaching right yes yes yeah absolutely good, good, we need good teachers and well if that, that's my pitch for fundamental research right we do need fundamental research because you know if you do not if you're not able to do curiosity based science you know if you cannot do small science how do you make good teachers right we can i mean there is a kind of a shift towards technology 
which is all great because we are using public money and we have to be useful. But I hope that there will be a little amount for fundamental research and for, you know, just doing, I don't know, maybe you could even call it, call it you know, esoteric science, you know, science for the fun of it. Actually, if you look at uh, soft matter physics, if you look at the spirit in which that science is done, yes, absolutely. It's esoteric, but, but it has enormous amount of applications. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the thing is, these are short-term applications. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So, right, I mean, these things are actually, you know, it's not fantasy. I mean, it, it will, it can happen if you get down to it. So, you know, because, again, you know, you got me started on this. I mean, we actually, you know, so I have a physics background. I have been working on colloidal systems. I have a work on drug delivery which by the way is our you know is one is my most highly cited paper which is uh, it came out in 2014 but uh, it has uh, accrued uh, 20.63 citations a year wow okay you see so it's almost like 290 citations as of a few days ago i like checking because yeah. you know it tells me okay you know it's uh, you have done, you know, something that was that was really cool because it's so interdisciplinary, you know. Because you mean, so it was basically uh, using some polymers, copolymers, to make micelles, and they would just self-assemble. So the word self-assembly will keep coming in. They self-assemble into micelles at well the body temperature. Absolutely. Okay? So what we did was, you know, we we. Uh, we uh, encapsulated uh, erythromycin, azithromycin, and aspirin. And we showed that, you know, these were injectable, these micelles. And all you need to do to kind of release the micelles, release the drugs from the core of the micelles was just to, you know, if it's for an external wound, just to apply an ice pack. Because just decrease the local temperature by 5 degrees and the micelles melt. Fantastic. Releasing the drugs. Yeah. Right. So, you uh, know. For the listeners, I will uh, be anyway linking the, the paper. This is a very, very interesting paper in Langmuir, uh, which uh, uh, Ranjini and her student uh, Rajib, right? Rajib yes, Pasak, yes. Uh, 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 wrote, co-wrote. And uh, it's it's a very interesting paper. It also uses dynamic light scattering and uh, uh, it has very interesting concepts related to micelles and uh, hydrophobicity and other things. Mm-hmm. I, I will be anyway linking that paper. Yeah, but... Uh, Ranjini, this is a very important thing. See, this is actually, you also published this in Langmuir, which is a very standard and important journal in, in soft matter physics. Uh, mm-hmm. And it has really got the attention of the people where Absolutely. you don't need to have really, you know, fancy journals to really <laughs> get your... I, I mean, if you look at my, if you look at my list of publications, you know, I have actually stayed away from the fancy journals. Yes. You know, I mean, we have sent, you know, things to the fancy journals but, you know, I don't see any, like you say, you know, I mean, look at my PRLs and look at my Langmuir. My Langmuir is, you know, head and shoulders above the PRL. And I mean, it gets cited every month even now. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, that is a very important lesson for all of us uh, working in, in the area, not only just in soft matter physics, but across various different disciplines. This is the most important aspect because there is scholarship in, in this work. Absolutely. And- you need to get the results out and people are looking, you know, people are reading them. Absolutely. So. I'm very glad you're you're uh, mentioning this, Ranjini, because, you know, increasingly the ecosystem, uh, especially in India, uh, students are getting uh, kind of a uh, little bit of confused because they don't know to what extent should they really project their work in big journals. No doubt mm-hmm. there might be some benefit, but what is right. important? to have a scholarly kind of a uh, you, you absolutely know, a rigorous study you know letters are very good but then you know of course you know you can write a letter i mean a very short cute paper and then write a longer paper but with nine students in the laboratory you know till well at least phd students till december of last year you know because you know you are often a thesis referee you yeah. have been, it's very difficult to get to that longer paper absolutely absolutely no you know? I- so, we got to expand on some of these discussions. This is a very important point, what you're right. mentioning. Because uh, I, I also know that you uh, have been so encouraging to many students uh, across uh, various different streams of research. And uh, mm-hmm. many students have also graduated from your from your lab. Right. Uh, uh, before we go into that, I would also want to just know what was your experience as a PhD student uh, while uh, studying in IAC? How, how was your overall experience? Fantastic. See, because... Uh, 
as you know, I worked with Professor Ajay Sooth, who's now also the principal scientific advisor. I have learned more from him than from anybody else. Because, you know, and even, you know, I have been a supervisor of, you know, PhD students now for 18 plus years. And, you know, I think I use Ajay as a template still. Because, you know, he was one person, you know, who wanted discipline. You know, yeah. you come on time, you have to, you know, meet with your data. You know, you have to repeat your data 10 times, you know, 100 times if required. And that is something I I do to this day. He was also very encouraging about uh, new but practical experiments. And, you know, so this is where, you know, I mean, Ajay is such a good, you know, he was such a good administrator in the lab because, you know, as a student, you don't have that, uh, that broad overview, right? So sometimes you... You want to do the craziest things, but then, you know, Ajay always reminded us that you have to finish your PhD and, you know, but he used to do it so nicely. Now, I'm not sure I do that as well, <laughs> you know, so he was so tactful. I try. I'm not sure. You have to ask my students to find out, you know, if I'm as nice or not. But, and then another thing, you know, uh, Ajay would insist on, you know, quality work in a thesis. And as you know, soft matter is... You know, not like doing rocket science. I, I always insist that my students graduate with about four papers. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. we write very bulky theses, but then we now we only have four years to write it. So therefore, you know, so uh, we're trying our hardest not to, you know, cut down on that, which means that, you know, we've got to start uh, working as soon as possible. I mean, of course, you know, my I'm more in an advisory role these days, but uh, we are also still setting up lots of experiments uh, these take a lot of time. My students are incredibly hardworking. And like I said, you know, by the time they submit their thesis, they get so much better than me. You know, I yeah. feel so proud when, you know, their postdoctoral mentors meet me you know, at a conference or somewhere and say that, thank you for training me. And I think, you know, that's basically the training that I've learned in uh, Ajay Sood's lab, the, the training that I got in Ajay's lab. Absolutely important. because. You know, generally, the way we measure impact in uh, academics, uh, we tend to do that slightly from a, uh, what should I say, metric viewpoint. Right. Whereas these are immeasurable impacts, right? Absolutely. Because nobody's going to tell you how well a student of yours actually is doing. And, Absolutely. Uh, and the interaction is also kind of two-way because the student would have also impacted the laboratory. And oh, this is very, very important. What you just mentioned now is that a, a person who really gets kind of knowledge from a particular source upon human interaction, uh, that is an immeasurable kind of... Oh, absolutely. You know, and I mean, I think teachers make all the difference, you know, from when you're a small child. Yes. yes. You know, I mean, <laughs> absolutely. You know, so you often hear that people don't like chemistry, but, you know, one good chemistry teacher can make you into a very good chemist. Absolutely right. Absolutely. In fact, you know, we'll come to this part of the chemistry because, you know, soft matter physics does uh, use a lot of chemistry in right. the form of understanding the concepts. And this is going to uh, be an important point which we're going to discuss uh, uh, going forward is that the the kind of uh, uh, ideas you will have to collect to become a soft matter physicist uh, mm-hmm. because... I, I know that you also did a lot of interesting light scattering experiments, which involves optics, uh, mm-hmm. which is then applied to questions related to soft matter systems, mice mm-hmm. and kind of mm-hmm. things. So what was your kind of training phase during that time? Uh, because you did really carry out some very interesting work also on speckles going forward. And right. uh, I just want to know uh, what was your training in terms of the optics uh, okay. during the phase of PhD and, uh, and going forward? Okay, so um, actually, you know, Pavan, if you look at my PhD, there's very little optics there because, you know, so uh, see, because one very important aspect, uh, a very key aspect of soft matter is their flow and deformation because these are viscoelastic materials. So unlike, you know, the materials that we see all around us all the time, well, I mean, uh, like say, you know, the, the, the table or the glass window or, you know, I mean, so these are, you know, hard to the touch. So you cannot imagine them as, materials that can actually flow but they do flow if you look at them you know for a very long time but then soft materials like lotions pastes you know mayonnaise all kinds of food stuff uh, 
colloidal systems like milk, you know, these are viscoelastic, which means that they can uh, well behave as a solid and a liquid at uh, time, you know, like reasonable time scales, right? Which is time scales we can measure in the lab. Uh, maybe milk was not such a good example, but anyway, it's colloidal. But uh, yeah, lotions, mayonnaise paste might be, you know, much better examples. So, uh, yeah, so basically these are materials whose viscosity as well as elasticity we can simultaneously study in the laboratory. And when I came into Ajay's lab, people were still doing a lot of light scattering and also, you know, just normal, you know, tabletop experiments like sedimenting colloids and looking at the colloids, which are microscopic, you know, micron sized. So you can look at them under a microscope. Okay, and you can actually discern the ways they are moving and how they look. So they were doing all that. So mainly microscopy and light scattering was going on. But at that time, there was a new rheometer that came into the chemical engineering department of ISC. This was part of a, of a project that was, you know, between physics and chemical engineering. And I was really at, you know, uh, I was not really supposed to work on it. But then... Uh, I made friends with a, well, somebody, you know, so she just came, she was in the UK as a, uh, in Unilever and GE for a very long time, Geeta Basappa. We just mm-hmm. happened to be friends. And, you know, she was the postdoc working on that, you know, that chemical engineering physics project. She had, she had just started working the rheometer. And then together and along with Ajay, of course, you know, who has so many ideas and he's so excited about them that, you know, well, I mean, you have no choice but to be excited as well so then and with you know of course you know with the blessings of our colleagues in uh, chemical engineering and in physics i actually i did all my phd in on saturdays and sundays because from monday to friday it was for that unilever project for which the rheometer was purchased so it was only so saturdays and sundays i worked round the clock and geeta was there she trained me on the rheometer and you know so we even used to take turns to go for lunches then we started, well, Gita had a home, so she used to get a box, a lunch box, because, you know, it was so exciting. And then we would talk to Ajay on Monday and, you know, he would, we'd do all the analysis. We knew exactly what we wanted to do on Saturday and Sunday because we just had two days, you know. So that also teaches you how to plan and, you know, also how to prepare for failures because also as, you know, Ajay, he's, Ajay is, you know, so ubiquitous in this uh, podcast. So he would say that, Ranjini, remember that 99% of your experiments will not work. So you have to work 26 hours a day. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I didn't think it was funny at that time, but I, I knew it was important. And, you know, it's only now that I realize how important that was. This is uh, an important issue, not only in terms of uh, the uh, the way uh, science actually is a, a pursuit, where you are uh, really looking at something in the dark, <laughs> right? Because you are not anticipating the specific kind of a result, and sometimes what is anticipated does not turn out to be a- as per the expectation. And Absolutely. Uh, this probably is also a fundamental difference between, let's say, research and development, because generally it gets kind of mixed up. Uh, yes. There is a lot of work to be done in the research phase, where, mm-hmm. as you mentioned, ninety-nine percent does not work. You know, this is a very important uh, Absolutely. point. Absolutely. You mentioned. And, right. Uh, going. Uh, Going into That's the so important for experimental science, right? Because you also have to conceptualize the right experiment. Absolutely right. Absolutely. Right, and of course, you know, you could of course conceptualize a wrong experiment, but then you keep working on it so that you know you get a you you make it better and better and better, not to fit a predetermined result, mm-hmm. but you know, so that you can get the best result that you that you that you that you can get, and then sometimes they also fail. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, yeah. you would also end up uh, discovering new things. That is how many many of the discoveries happen, right? Because an and and you know, even in soft matter, as you know, because you know you do soft matter. Because see, because I just tell you about a very recent work. If that's okay, yeah, so please. okay, so you know, so we have this work. You probably know about it because you were, I think, you were the referee for the thesis. So uh, Palak's work, yes. you know, so she was basically pushing out cornstarch with water. Okay. Yeah. You know, in a very confined geometry, right? And these things, you know, they are very interesting to us because they give rise to what are called elastic uh, instabilities. 
Yes. Right. So, um, so, uh, so you know, so initially we worked on a shear thinning cornstarch material, but then there are also ways of shear thickening the cornstarch, which means as you push them, they become thicker. So we were working on this, hoping that we look at the pattern between the cornstarch and the water. But remember, there's a there's an interface between the outside air and the cornstarch, which is being pushed out. And that's where, you know, we very accidentally, or maybe I should say serendipitously, we found out some very interesting dynamics that we didn't know existed. And we actually made a paper out of that. Um, and, you know, we also, we also calculated certain quantities, uh, you know, that were very interesting. They were also correct, and they matched with other... Uh, you know, other experimental work showing that, you know, our, um, so this is very speculative, but, you know, we were very happy with this work because this is not we were looking for. And we find this entirely new thing. And we also have a very nice explanation for it, which is at least not violating physical principles. So, you know, maybe one day we are going to, you know, be able to understand, maybe actually visualize these force chains, which we say gave rise to, you know, that. And as you see, this is also not in those, you know, very, very fancy journals, but we got the best referee reports. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? I would urge every listener, especially the students, to to really pay attention to what we are, what we are actually discussing. It is the scholarly kind of scholastic kind of work which is more important than you know the so-called impact factors and other other things in fact i'm very glad Ranjini, you are mentioning this particular thing because somehow it is it is getting lost in a lot of uh, oh, I know. and uh, most of the time to the detriment because you could also see that a lot of the students may have to take specific steps which might not be ethical also many a time oh, absolutely you do hear of so much scientific fraud nowadays and you know it of course i mean i i, I yeah, yeah well <laughs> yes and that's because of you know you have this there is this pressure to be cute and in this pressure to be cute you lose the rigor rigor right? and you know I, I think see because the the referees are the same you know where, wherever they send them eventually and i don't know at least you know i mean we have uh, i'm pretty sure all our papers you know they 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 sometimes i think this is a different paper but this is because of very good referee reports Absolutely. You also sit back and think because, you know, it's not like you have to submit the paper in the next 10 days. Absolutely. You know? So I'm very, maybe old fashioned that way, but uh, I have kind of held on to that. This is an important aspect also because uh, increasingly uh, sometimes people, especially outside science, people think that uh, criticism is a negative thing. Mm. Uh, in, in science, it is one of the most positive aspects. Absolutely. Of people, right. I mean, well, no, with good peer review, your really work is nothing, right? Absolutely. Right. You need good peer review. I mean, I am an editor of journals and I do see how difficult it is, especially after the pandemic, to get referees. Absolutely. You know, that's because, you know, people are, of course, busy with their work. But, you know, one thing that we all have to do is, you know, we have to referee papers because, you know, of course, it takes time. Of course, the journal will keep pestering you. But then, you know, you also get good ideas and, you know, you get... Uh, it's always good to, you know, also critically, you know, review somebody else's work because it helps you to critically review yours. Because, yeah. you know, when I sometimes say, oh, this introduction, forget about the science. The introduction is not that well written. Then I look at my own papers and I think, you know, okay, this is not well written either. Absolutely right. Absolutely. You, you know, so. That kind of uh, bringing back the criticism to oneself is so, yeah. so important as as you. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely, an element of uh, you know, of, uh, you know, openness in science, which is also mm. very good, because you mm. can see this is all happening in good faith, and mm. uh, it's purely yeah. based on the fact that you have you respect the person who is on the other side, and uh, generally yes. the review is anonymous, so you would actually take it uh, uh, take it on the on the on the merit of what has been already mentioned. So absolutely. Uh, Something I am very glad, Ranjini, you are bringing this up because this is something uh, uh, which is also crucial for not only students but also, mm -hmm. for example, anybody who is, let's say, starting up a laboratory, especially in India, uh, because one is getting caught in between, let's say, something which is supposed to be very uh, fancy in terms of uh, the impact and other things, and mm -hmm. the other part is to look at what you are really trained in and also having expertise in, 
and really doing something meaningful in within that particular absolutely and with some rigor you know yes yes absolutely absolutely that's yeah. precisely right yeah, so getting to the bottom of it as much as you can yeah yeah precisely right precisely right. Yeah. and this, this is such an important kind of uh, training you get uh, because mm-hmm. when you are doing this uh, as part of your day in and day out kind of routine of uh, mm-hmm. looking at the uh, the the inf- inf- or important information what you get from referee reports learning and uh, uh, replying to that and uh, that's an mm-hmm. important yeah yeah now we got to branch to towards your research and uh, mm-hmm. i'll request you to just give us an overview of what is what is the kind of research you have been doing uh, within your uh, laboratory uh, uh, at uh, raman research institute what kind of projects are you working on uh, sure. what kind of uh, experimental uh, kind of uh, explorations what you are now looking into could you just give us a brief, brief overview of that that would be nice sure yeah so uh, i realized i didn't really uh, answer your question about optics in my you know doctoral and post doctoral phase but anyway so uh, maybe uh, later sometime okay. so uh, we can actually get to know about yeah, yeah please okay. Let me do that because there was also some interesting work in postdoc. I was telling you about rheology and forgot to tell you about the optics. So, as you know, you know, so I, I worked with Doug Durian at UCLA for my first postdoc, and uh, Doug is a guy who knows, you know, light scattering very well. He was part of a team that really worked on this technique called diffusing ray spectroscopy, which is, you know, how you measure uh, very dense suspension, you know, very opaque media, because uh, usually light scattering, as dynamic light scattering, as you said. that happens with the uh, materials that are very weakly scattering light so he had these very cool ideas as to he and well many other stalwarts mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah uh, they had these very nice ideas about how to uh, you know me- ha- how to actually understand you know very dense opaque medias with media with light okay so because you know as you know once the light is inside the opaque media medium it's lost right in the sense that it's randomized so when it comes out on the other side it comes out with some information but what they showed was that this information can actually be unraveled from that you know that that diffuse signal and you can actually say a lot about the structure and dynamics of the medium even though you can't quite see through it right so then dog of course was is a stalwart you know i mean he's done some amazing work Uh, he's particularly interested in granular matter these days so my first project there was on foam and foam as you know you know these are like so one of my i was actually i've also worked on gillet for me wow because most of our you know even now you know many of our uh, uh, samples actually come from supermarkets so you know so i have a paper on you know granular segregation where uh, one of our granular media well i mean in one case it was mustard seeds we uh-huh. actually you know we use mustard seeds with the jacket the black jacket without the black jacket you know right. because uh, well i know mean, this is a long story of course and uh, yeah so i mean there's you know corn starch for instance you know you always do the first experiments with just on ordinary corn starch Absolutely. okay that you get from you know the same corn starch that you used to thicken soups yes. right so yeah so then you know so we worked on foams so foams as you know these are gas bubbles in some soapy liquid right but these are very jammed gas bubbles you can think of them like that and now uh, dark has done a lot of work about how foams will scatter light so foams are also opaque because there are so many interfaces so now you know when you send light through foams the light will get it will it will dif- become diffuse by the time it comes out because it's it's scattering many times at these many interfaces so then how do you get information out so then for a foam that purely scatters dark did a lot of work and so did many other people and we understood it very well okay how to find out about the foam and you know foams also age which means as you know the bubbles become bigger the bubbles pop you know the water that sediments that's called drainage okay so these are aging phenomena so he had done a lot of work on that all good but then when i came in there was one thing that was really bothering him and that is what so you know so there is something called extinction right extinction is equal to scattering plus absorption right Absolutely. so he had he felt he had worked a lot on absorption or on scattering now what is the liquidy part of foams they also absorb light nice 
Okay, so then we put rhodamine B, which is a plumber's dye. So that yeah. is where I said that you know you do it from you know you can do your research in hardware shops and supermarkets. So then we put some plumber's dye, and then we did light scattering, and yes, you know the signal was very different on the other side. So then we analyzed the data, and we could see that you know the little channels of water around the gas bubbles and foam, they were actually acting like optical fibers. Wonderful. Wonderful. You know? it was actually you know even with absorption you are actually getting out less light than you thought you would which meant that you know there was this total internal reflection that was going on okay inside the little channels of water around the bubbles in the foam and then we also found out that there's a sea sponge which does exactly that this is of course a, a you know a sponge that is almost entirely you know its shell is made of calcium but then it also has these these little you know you know channels okay so it it lives in the deep sea it goes up okay it gets light and then it goes right to the bottom of the sea and then it actually glows wonderful wonderful yeah, yeah. so that was one thing so you know i had a very exciting two years in dogs life i think if you look at the exciting stuff divided by the timeline i think that is where i probably had the most fun and also of course it was los angeles which was That's very nice yeah That's so and then of course then we had this other technique so you know as you know when you do light scattering you are really looking at stationary media which means that you know media which are at least not changing very much over the time scale of obs- observation right you know i mean they are, they are yeah so you know when you do light scattering so that's st- stationarity but then what about you know suppose you are uh, in foam for instance where the particles are growing bigger you know the by particles i mean the bubbles or you know suppose you are shaking a bed of sand you know the sand the dynamics of the sand keeps changing with time because initially you know it just jumps up then it starts colliding with the ga- uh, grains then at some point you know it loses energy and then you know its potential energy is high it just falls down right so you know it's always different so then you know doing a time resolved spectroscopy which is what dynamic light scattering and diffusive wave spectroscopy is all about these kind of you know they fail okay mm-hmm. to really look at the very you know that's the small time details so then we came up with this uh, new technique called speckle visible uh, speckle visibility spectroscopy mm-hmm. where you know we actually had a line scan camera and you just expose it for different times so the idea was that you know if the dynamics of the material was slower than the exposure time okay you'd see some interesting signals but if the if the exposure of your camera was so slow that you know the dynamics you know the relaxation times of the materials are actually faster so you know the relaxation process had already happened by you know by the time the the camera completed one exposure then you got no data at all yes yes wonderful yeah so you basically change the exposure time and then you get some you know some idea now in uh, in my second post doctoral work which was at johns hopkins university in baltimore i well i mean i did optics but with x rays so uh-huh. <laughs> there i came back to uh, uh, you know again time resolved spectroscopy so autocorrelation spectroscopy but not with light but with x rays and the reason why we used x rays because light as you know the wavelengths are much longer so you can really look at much longer length scales but then here we wanted to look at you know the particle scale of nanometer sized objects so basically the wavelength of the radiation has to be shorter so then we used x rays which is of course you know it's very difficult to do x ray experiments because they are not coherent right so you go to a synchrotron source and uh, and you know but then there you know you'll get like 10 days a year okay so then and as they said no photon shall go unscattered so then you just work there and you know you don't sleep you you analyze throughout the light throughout the night because you know if there's a problem you have to repeat the experiment within the 5 days because otherwise you are coming back in 6 months so you know, i think that's where my rheometer use over only saturday and sunday helped me a lot nice nice that's wonderful <laughs> wonderful overview of what what you've done you can also see uh, one of the things uh, which is an important lesson is that you started with the dynamic light scattering with an optical frequency then also moved to the x rays this is the power of understanding electromagnetic spectrum yeah, absolutely and you know even materials and that's what soft matter is you know so i don't know i mean soft matter is so wonderful that way because you know there are so many soft matter you know soft materials 
you know, they all look very different. Of course, you know, they are all governed by the same general principles. So therefore, you know, there is so much you can do. Absolutely. Not just for fundamental science, but also for application, also for, well, you know, industry. Absolutely right. Absolutely. In fact, exactly. uh, this is a, a very important uh, kind of area of research, which is turning out to be an important link between physics and biology too. Uh, because yes. that's where a lot of uh, things are also happening nowadays. And soft matter uh, and people with a uh, r- good kind of understanding of soft matter research yes. have been able to make this uh, connection very uh, effectively. And, right. Uh, it's, no, it's interesting you say that because uh, one of my first very interdisciplinary projects was with uh, ophthalmologists in, uh, you know, the Johns Hopkins University uh, Hospital. Nice. Because they were looking at macular degeneration, mm-hmm. you know, which is basically uh, that happens, you know, in older adults when, you know, the polymers kind of in your, uh, in your viscous matrix, you know, they kind of get entangled. So therefore, you know, that doesn't give a, a nice clear path to light. So one way they resolve these knots in the polymers is by sending, uh, you know, uh, beams of lasers, right? And not Absolutely. beams, but really by, you know, sending uh, mm-hmm. little, well, shots of lasers. Huh? So uh, pulses, as we call them. So then, you know, so they, we actually did uh, experiments, but, you know, with, with, well, eyes of, you know, dead animals, you know, the, so they actually, they extracted the viscous humor and then we did, we looked at the viscosity, mm-hmm. nice. you know, in our geometer, which is where we look at our other uh, materials. Of course, it's a very heterogeneous material, but then we got some idea of, you know, how a, a degenerated eye, you know, mm-hmm. how uh, the properties, you know, how even, and obviously here, you know, when you do rheology, when you look at the flow of these materials, you can also indirectly, you can say a lot about the structure. So we use that a little bit, you know, and well, I mean, and the doctors decided what kind of, you know, laser pulses they need uh, to do their surgery, I suppose. I mean, we never published it because, uh, yeah, we we never published it. Yeah. Wonderful. So you you, uh, had a stint at uh, UCLA and then you moved to Johns Hopkins. Uh, How was your experience, US experience? You had a good time. It was was great fun. I, I loved the US. You know, of course, it was, I was in a hostel before, but this was the first true independence, you know, and the first true money. Uh, Okay. So then, then, you know, I explored a lot. I traveled a lot. I trekked a lot. You know, I can't do so much trekking anymore, but I'm so glad I I did so much, you know, so much of those, you know, those activities when I was in the US, because I also had the enthusiasm. Now I find that there's no time at all. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, I really liked wherever I've gone, to be very honest. I just wanted to come back at some point, you know. Uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to come back. And, so you, and I'm you, glad I did. Yeah, you were already thinking about coming back uh, while going or uh, uh, you... Uh, no, I, I, well, yeah, at the time of going, I mean, in the first few months were, you know, they were... Um, uh, they were very sad for me because, you know, new country and, you know, I had never been that alone. But then, of course, that's true for everybody. Uh, in a few months, you know, I loved it and I didn't want to go back. But then every time you go back, it does also feel very good. And, uh, you know, I also had very nice memories in India, you know, memories of science. So I saw no reason why I shouldn't come back here. And honestly, I have nothing to complain, you know, at least, you know, as far as research money is concerned I, I really have had no no problem so and, you know the, i've had the best students who worked with me mm-hmm. so and you know they're all very doing very well now mm-hmm. and as a teacher that makes me extremely proud yeah yeah that's uh, something which is very uh, crucial while doing research uh, which is also going to kind of link to our next phase of the discussion which is your research now what you are doing in your yeah. this is what your original question was but yeah no, <laughs> <laughs> you have to keep reminding me because yeah so uh, my research you know if you uh, I work on experimental soft matter of course and you know we do get inputs from theorists and uh, you know people who do computational work um, but then you know these are very complex systems because remember these are very real systems so you know at least theoretically and computationally you can do you can come up with some approximate theories you can you can use equations that are really meant for other simpler systems you know and you can try to make them 
somehow you know suit to your system Absolutely. but then uh, yeah and you do reproduce some of the uh, things that you see but essentially it's an experimental science and uh, if you look at our work in the lab over the last well say the last decade or so we can actually divide it into three very broad uh, uh, areas so one is uh, fundamental research of course you know which is really my bread and butter and which is what i've been doing you know since day one and you know in that you know we really look try to look at the structure dynamics stability flow deformation of a range of soft matter uh, with uh, so a range of soft materials but you know our focus is mainly on colloidal suspensions microgels which are also colloidal in nature but you know they are thermo responsive so they have their own you know other uses and also some granular suspensions so we are basically working on suspensions these days and one of the issues on these suspensions that we find very interesting is how they behave when they are very densely packed yes. so we are really trying to get answers for the glass transition so that's number 1 which is our fundamental research number 2 is just for the fun of it you know just for playing around you know just to go and give talks to schools and colleges and you know get people to say wow and you know i i recently gave a copy with curiosity talk on viscous elasticity and this 11 year old which i think you saw right on facebook wrote this you know heartwarming letter you know saying that everybody should go and do experiments in ranjini's lab and i thought okay you know you know i can't ask for anything else absolutely again come back anything. to the point, yeah the point of the impact this is an impact isn't it you know this is what really makes your life you know worth it you know those you know those ages are struggling but then you know yeah you do have to simplify things and you know communicating you know research you know that's that so much fun you know that that eureka moment you know in your audiences audience members eye so the eyes so then basically you know so in this uh, these tabletop experiments that we do uh, they start off you know because it's fun and because it's actually possible in soft matter mm-hmm. right i mean these are such easy experiments you just need like a you know few thousand rupees and a good digital camera to start many experiments and you know of course we also like i mean Pollock's thesis, as you know, PhD thesis. This was all, you know, like tabletop experiments. Absolutely, absolutely, you're right. You're Except, right. of course, some Janus particles that that we made and one confocal microscope. But the the the, the meat of a thesis was tabletop, and you know, so these teach us so much about fluid mechanics, mm, mm, right? Mm, absolutely. And so, yeah, and so this is for outreach, and you know, I do a lot of outreach, and it's so much fun. So that is the number two, you know, fundamental outreach, and the third is actually doing things that are well, hopefully going to be useful for society and for humanity. So you know, that's also something that funders well ask for, and why shouldn't they? I mean, if everybody did fundamental research, you know, I mean, we'd be in a bit of bit of a soup. But then, uh, so in uh, and in this, you know, this. Uh, you know this applied soft matter research i can just tell you about two kinds of work that we did so one was really on the you know the geometry of stick slip the 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 phenomenon of stick slip in foams now as you know uh, stick slip also happens between uh, tectonic plates in an earthquake so you know so one thing that we try to make are these laboratory models for large scale phenomena but when we use soft materials you know so actually if you look at our you know these uh, technological you know the more innovative you know industrially or you know application oriented projects so you can also you know like divide them into two parts so one is you know really things that you can associate with geophysics so one is this you know like i told you tectonic plates again you know we ended up not uh, publishing all the work maybe it will happen some day similarly for a landslide that we made in the lab okay on an inclined plane which we were done in classical mechanics so right. clay is a colloidal system right so then you basically you know you just make an inclined plane with different degrees of roughnesses and then just get clay to slide on it and then you see the instabilities that form you get to understand landslide so one thing that we do did and we did publish and is also well cited in spite of the fact that you know it's not in one of the it's in a very good journal soft matter but not one of those you know the the very 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 fancy and fashionable journals is you know so this was you know where we actually modeled a delta formation in our lab 
So wow. we took the colloidal clay and we just let them settle. We have more than one paper. We also have one in Faraday discussions. So uh, you just let them settle. Okay, and then, you know, we looked at the effect of salt on the settling of clays because clays are, as you know, electrostatically charged, right? Mm -hmm. And so and that's why, you know, you form river deltas because at the delta where your, the river is confluencing with the sea, there is more salt, right, because of the sea. And that's how the deposition happens. Now, I've spoken to a geophysicist about it and he said, you know, we knew this, that sedimentation increases when there's salt. But then what was... He said, interesting in our work is that we also took the sediments and we put them under an electron microscope, mm -hmm. which is the only quantum mechanics I've done in the sense that, you know, you're really using electrons as a wave to model your sediments. But, you know, you're modeling them at, at length scales that you cannot see using light. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, so these are things that, you know, I think they have immediate uses. But because, you know, I have to graduate, you know, PhD students, and also because, you know, uh, maybe one day we'll also collaborate and, you know, get these to the logical conclusion. Right now, we are just, you know, coming up with this and uh, the papers are getting noticed. So I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of, you know, at least my, my, my fervent hope is that a lot of, you know, future work will happen on these. Uh, yeah, because these are very, very relevant problems. And like I said, you know, it's today's problems. And they are actually, you know, problems that have a very clear solution. Mm -hmm. True, true. This is also the power of uh, soft matter uh, science, because uh, you would be able to really give some meaningful kind of uh, connections to whatever is done in the laboratory to the outside. And what you see every day, even in the kitchen, right? I was just about to tell. That <laughs> okay. It's now coming big uh, from a scientific uh, kind of viewpoint. There's a lot of interest in understanding the food, what we consume, especially the right. food. Of course, yes. a lot of, uh, unprocessed food is already understood reasonably, but they right. still understand. Uh, but this is a very fascinating kind of plethora of, uh, you know. It's my favorite uh, topic because, you know, what they call uh, uh, molecular gastronomy. Exactly. Okay? I actually, you know, I haven't worked on food yet. But, um, yeah, but, you know, I did give a, a journal club talk in RRI once where oh, it was journal club or I've forgotten exactly. It was a science club talk. So, where, you know, so this talk was on molecular gastronomy and I spoke about three things that I thought were really fantastic. One, of course, was about baking a cake or baking good bread. The other was about, you know, making very good ice cream. You know, how do you get the right texture of ice cream? You basically dunk them in liquid nitrogen so that the colloids, you know, they, they preserve their, you know, the, the orientation and, you know, that, you know, yeah. So it's, you know, it, it's not, uh, yeah, it's, it's not, uh, it's not too crystalline, neither is it too glossy, basically, you know, because it's the, it's the texture as well as the, the, the hardness. Right. So we never got around to doing that experiment. And the third thing that I spoke about, because you say cooked food. So this is actually an ignoble uh, one by one of my own, you know, friends and colleagues called Gregory Weiss in uh, University of California at Irvine. So he got the ignoble for showing how you can unboil a boiled egg. Oh, very nice. Okay, which is basically polymer physics. So, and you know, this actually, this became a paper in uh, physical chemistry, chem chemical physics. And of uh -huh. course, you know, if you, if you read the title of the physics, you wouldn't know that it's got anything to do with eggs. Exactly. But then, you know, so he has these fantastic uh, TEDx talks. And now, you know, I cannot uh, underestimate the importance of, you know, TEDx talks. I mean, they're so good. So, so what he basically did was... Uh, you take an egg, you know, so here he really worked on the egg white, but yeah. since then he's also done the egg yellow, the, the yolk, you know, so these are polymers. So he's basically just done polymer physics because mm -hmm. when you uh, boil an egg, it just, uh, you know, it, 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 be it becomes clumpy, right? But then he's done this small physical reaction, mainly adding urea to mm -hmm. melt the knots just by stirring it with urea and, you know, you unboil the egg. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's very so. interesting. Very, very interesting. Yeah. So uh, you then also have a, a, a large group. Uh, how yes. many people are there in your group? So right now, we've graduated uh, some students. Hmm. So uh, right now, I have six students on my role. Okay, very nice. Uh, six PhD students, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And they, you know, so because it's a soft matter lab, we do very different things as much as possible. Yeah. 
because you know it's not very difficult to uh, but of course you know whenever we are setting up techniques for instance we recently set up an optical tweezer we set up a real dielectric experiment where along with rheology we can also simultaneously look at the uh, dielectric response so for these we've done these things in small groups mm. you know we're also setting up multiple like a holographic tweezer so very for big. these uh, you know all these very well so yeah so these we do in small teams and then you know people bring different problems uh, yeah. uh, you know which they work on using these techniques which we've set up fantastic we, we've set up granular matter and you know we are looking at some very exciting problems there so uh, two aspects i would want to just kind of go a little further and uh, mm-hmm. understand is your transition from uh, us to india and uh, how you went about setting up your lab and second point is uh, uh, the training phase of uh, students you know that's an important thing because you know to transfer your know how both in terms of concepts and techniques uh, to uh, upcoming phd students or even uh, senior undergrad students uh, this is a very important part uh, how mm. how do you go about doing it transition right so when i first came here when i came to india first so i i started of course i had an empty room but you know i got a very good seed uh, funding mm-hmm. so you know i i bought a rheometer and then we could actually start uh, quite soon i got i had my first student was a project student called harsha mm-hmm. harsha mohan so she is now in I, she's in paris right now but then she was a vsp student she later on went and did her phd in gotting uh, in mines in germany so uh, you know so we we started the lab we even have a couple of papers together and yes. that was the time when you know we actually we worked together right mm-hmm. so harsha was a very receptive student so you know she would uh, she would work very hard and very well and she was you know uh, she had this very strong sense of ethics you know which i really liked so we it's so important to trust each other when you're doing any collaboration right you have to speak in the same language okay you have to be on the same wavelength and harsha was fantastic you know and actually i even had a french student for some time so he was really he was here on a cycling tour but then he just you know hopped by my lab saying that hey i want to do physics and all we had then so that's when we actually started our helicho helicho cell experiments nice. you know so yeah so he he was in between his ms and phd and it was great you know because you know we were in the lab all the time we were working together we were also troubleshooting together i remember we were on conference calls you know with folks in the us you know the princeton camera folks because it was not working and that was wonderful but then of course you know eventually your lab grows and you know even though we are scientists we become administrators mm-hmm. whether we want it or not right okay. yeah so then uh, and then in as your group grows you know there are always these at least you know maybe i've been very lucky with students because mm-hmm. i've also had these fantastic students who actually ended up mentoring the younger students you know who've just joined the lab for instance you know uh, my earlier student devashish for instance you know he is the one who you know just before lo- uh, leaving for his postdoc in dusseldorf he told me you know we should be making we should be synthesizing this colloid and that colloid and then i already had a, i think a second year he was in a second year then as phd student so then you know because you know he had some time you know before he went to dusseldorf you know going through his visa and other procedures and maybe waiting for his defense though i can't remember so you know that's when our chemistry started mm-hmm. so, you know actually now you know the directions that we are taking it's it's very self organized nice. you know it's it's very self in the and you know some of it is actually organized by you know some of these incredible students that i have or i have had mm-hmm. and i remember granular matter for instance you know there was this uh, person called pavan you know he uh, so he just walks into my office you know r r i we are very open as you know anybody can walk in right uh, so he just walks in and says uh, hey i want to do granular matter i said i don't do granular matter he said but i want to do granular matter with you you know wow. because Uh, yeah because i was doing table top experiments so I, i i i thought fine and then the first thing he did so he went to mg road you know which is where you know that was that time that was our go to place for buying equipment he bought a a two in one speaker and he used that as a granular shaker wonderful wonderful isn't it you know it, it just makes soft matter so lovely that's why and then you know he just put these pills like you know medicine pills yeah. and two balls 
okay yeah. and he vibrated it and he showed the light and frost effect which you yeah. see on a hot pan which you know i know you put it online right yes you know like Yes, so basically, the pills are vibrating, but the balls are vibrating even more, and they don't touch the pills, right? Yes. So yeah, so that's how many things have started. See, sometimes I just have to give a little nudge. Mm. Mm. Now you know there are some students, you know, all they need is that nudge, yes. and of course, you know, it's not just you know doing the experiment; it's also you know writing, it's mm. also presenting. Absolutely. So uh, we do have, we try our best to have very regular group meetings, mm. and. Uh, Uh, i hope my students agree with me but i do feel that you know many of them you know who you know i thought were not good speakers i i see because i i like talking as you can see our group meetings go on for two and a half to three years you know i think my students are also very enthusiastic about giving talks nice and not just to a you know like a knowledgeable assigned you know a knowledgeable scientist audience but also to children during science day right. Yes, you know so we take that very seriously you know trying to communicate your research to you know the next generation and yeah. uh, as far writing is concerned i think my luck I'm, i'm being very honest here you know it also depends a lot on the student because see not everybody uh, might have taken writing very seriously and there is some amount in some cases not all i mean there are some people who are fantastic you know they can actually submit a paper with one revision from me <laughs> but then we've also gone through 37 revisions so i think that you know our highly cited paper i think that had 35 or 37 revisions okay rajiv wrote well but you know we just thought you know because it was so interdisciplinary we thought you know we are not getting this right and even when i read it now i think oh i shouldn't have written it like that mm-hmm. you know so that you know we 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 keep trying and you know so and because my i think my students are very accommodating they know that i am very paranoid about the way i write so you know there are some who you know who, who kind of also you know but i don't want them to do what i ask them to do you know so i mean as a as a mentor you know it is my job to sometimes they come up with better ideas than i do so Very so we basically i think the only way you know i train is by by repetition no, you know you just, you just keep doing it you know so many times you know you will get better for some people it's two times for some people it could be 10 times but i'm happy to do it 50 times i mean this is something that i am you know it's i mean yeah that i practice this almost every time this is an important uh, issue because you know you generally don't get it right uh, at the first time most of the time right yeah uh, even, even uh, while writing uh, because science uh, writing science is uh, brings in its own challenges because clarity is at the at the center oh, absolutely you know i never write the first draft of a paper mm-hmm. i never do it and sometimes you know the sometimes the first draft comes well you know sometimes they are really bad but i'm happy to sit and edit it you know till 2 am 3 am in the morning because i also you know so you cannot i mean sometimes we sit down and edit it but after zoom that's become less but then you know i edit it in a different color so that you know a student knows you know what are the changes that i have made absolutely so yeah it's only very rarely you know suppose a student is in the steering hurry to go for a post doc that i've actually written complete paragraphs mm. and when i have done you know I, i i really think that you know i shouldn't have done it because you know part of the training is also how you present your work and absolutely you know, the first thing the people you know people who are listening you know you meet a person who's from another you know a scientist but from another discipline they see how you talk about your work right before okay. going into the details so yeah and most of But the time it's science, very important most of the time in science you would be probably talking to people who are fellow scientists but from a different background Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, you have to be comprehensible to them. Yeah. yeah. You have to make the wavelength match and they will not make the make the wavelength match, but it's your job as yeah. communicator to make them understand. Yeah. This is something uh, very important. I I also keep telling this to my students. Mm. And uh, because for example, giving a talk at your department means that you are talking to fellow uh student yeah. or some other person who may not be working on similar area in fact that is where the thought of us See, in our uh, case is, i'm sorry, I'm sorry. no 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 please go ahead, go ahead. See, in our case you have to realize so we are in the department of soft condensed matter yeah 
Yeah. You see, and also, unfortunately, you know, you find that when there's, you know, you're giving a talk on soft matter, you see that, you know, we have very, very, you know, discrete divisions. Mm, mm. So, you know, that, that, that cross talk is actually very less in RRI. Mm, mm. Okay. I mean, we do talk to well one or two theorists sometimes because they work in our area. But, you know, there are people who are working, for instance, you know, on quantum gravity and special relativity. And somehow, you know, the crosstalk is very, very limited in RRI. So, therefore, you know, the most of the times when we talk, you know, the group seminars, you know, we have like 50 people from soft matter who can show up. Mm, mm. You know, we do have the critical numbers. So then we get used to, you know, pitching talks at that level, you know, at the, at the rather technical level. Exactly. This is a, a kind of a challenge for a lot of students and uh, even for a lot of people who are kind of reasonably well versed in the, in the art and science of yes. talks. Uh, so, Raji, this brings us to also a slightly more broader question of the way science is done in India and uh, vis-a-vis the global science. And science, generally, it's not probably appropriate to call something as Indian science and uh, some some country-based science, but because science is kind of you, almost uh, you know global and universal in the yeah. uh, But the the way we uh, look at the scientific pursuit, uh, that can change from country to country. What mm-hmm. are your broad views? In what way the ecosystem in India for research, especially scientific research, can improve? And in what way we can bring in some specific and uh, positive changes in terms of either policy or other things? What is your I, mean, I think, you know, so I think fundamental, meaningful research, mm-hmm. I think needs, you know, a more impetus because as you know you know there has been this steady you know drift towards you know big science and you know very you know which is really you know it started diverting from science and it has gone into the realm of technology you know almost you know maybe even engineering so you know i think we also need to you know take a little pause and you know do a little bit of more fundamental research because see also you know i mean the research should be you know it's all good to do you know i don't know i mean uh, very very big science but you know we also need some science that will uh, that will you know there will be this feedback into you know the ability to do that kind of science and do in sp- particular experimental science in colleges and universities absolutely you know you cannot do you know big science in colleges and universities and you shouldn't have to because these are still you know like students who are trying to figure out you know so they can't spend their whole you know like tenure you know doing some very challenging experiments but these have to be you know meaningful small experiments you know but with a big message and you know once that big message is there you know tattooed somewhere in your brain you can go ahead and come with your own big ideas later on so i think and you know that is where i think you know the national the nrf as you know you know there does seem to be a nice impetus to fundamental research and uh, i hope that aspect of you know nrf at least you know sees light of day and you know it's very successful because another thing about nrf is you know is uh, seeding uh, research in colleges and universities and we yeah. are such talented people uh, you know students who are just waiting for an opportunity the other thing probably is you know some more opportunities to do research you know to really good students because you know for a country this big we really, really don't have the seats do we so uh, absolutely you know no. a student you know, in the US, you know, they have so much opportunity, yes. right? But here, you know, I mean, it's, it's cutthroat. I mean, to get that, you know, one out of the 10 seats, you know, for instance, you know, if I were to today, you know, if somebody wants to do, say, uh, you know, an undergrad at uh, ISC, I mean, you know, they take what? I think 200 people. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's so, you know, so I think that also, you know, we have to kind of, you know, this... Uh, we, we are still very elitist in that way. Of course, you know, our funds are also limited. But I hope, you know, NRF can can do something about it or, you know, any new way of thinking, new policies, you know. Because, you know, I don't think anybody is good or bad, but, you know, it's the way people have been nurtured. So if we can, you know, improve things, you know, from earlier on, yeah, you know, education, you know, even, you know, primary, secondary, higher secondary, college, you know, I think, you know, yeah, so we need more and better opportunities and not from just for higher education, but, but all the way. 
absolutely right and you know fundamental because you know and, and the other thing that you know i keep interrupting you but you know fundamental research i think the best way to understand fundamental science is you know by 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 do, you know doing something that is you know Uh, related to materials that you use every day and you know most of these things can be categorized as soft materials you can buy them from the supermarket and you can do these fantastic experiments on them it's like you know did you think why this happens you know why the toothpaste didn't flow out of the tube when you open the lid you know when you open the cap so stuff like that and and th- these are very cheap experiments and you know these are things we should be doing in universities you know except for having you know interferometers that never work i mean they should work i mean i'm saying you know <laughs> interferometers are fantastic you know double slit is extremely important but yeah. they should work and you know i know in you know even good universities where you know it's difficult to get them to work okay. you know simple optical experiments so that's where the money needs to go mm-hmm. and also you know the spirit for experiments because you know even in bengal where i came from you know it was always assumed that when you said you wanted to do mm-hmm. physics you want to do experiments yeah nice nice You know, is, you know, like oh, experiments. Okay, you know, you want to do stuff with your hands. And I said, yes, I want to do things with my hands because you know, I come up with something. You know, I have questions, and I need to see that. You know, yeah, absolutely. Right. I can get the answer for myself. You know, nice. Like a proof of concept. I mean, it is very exciting to me. But somehow, you know, it has been uh, considered as a not as you know worthy activity as theoretical physics, at least in West Bengal. Mm. So this elitist mentality that we need to break that is something which is uh, which is in a, a problem in physics uh, yes the, undoubtedly there have been great people who have done outstanding theoretical physics from india right most to saha and to everybody a lot of them mm-hmm. uh, but uh, the the culture of doing experiments is also equally important that is something yes. in craze and also touching on the point what you were kind of alluding to uh, is the fact that basic sciences are foundations for everything including yes. engineering including engineering you cannot absolutely. do good engineering without a good foundation of absolutely and you know to do that engineering or to do the basic sciences you also need the good teachers absolutely. you know so pedagogical good pedagogical lecturers you know who are just going to you know like yeah just the basic concepts you know just the slightly advanced i mean you know you need to have such a strong foundation in that for you know for all kinds of science yeah i mean absolutely yeah. hey, prachidani we we keep actually kind of reinforcing this point because see that there is a very beautiful kind of uh, continuum from uh, basic sciences to engineering sciences from engineering right. sciences to translation from trans- right to market and mm-hmm. uh, at every part there is some kind of connection which can happen but it, uh, it is something which people should probably also realize that this continuum has to somehow be preserved you cannot just put every one particular part of the uh, yeah, i think that's a very dangerous way to go and uh, yeah absolutely you know we are just looking at those so called you know very uh, fashionable uh, things things yeah and uh, it's good to do the fashionable things but not at the expense of the other things and also you know, if you look at the coverage in the media you know there's a lot of science that is happening in newspapers right but uh, so yeah so i mean it's very good you know uh, yeah you know we have to go out and give more talks you know maybe talk about the fundamental work that we do so that people also understand that you know these things which are maybe not news worthy all the time absolutely you know Absolutely. they should be circulated and I, i really like how you you know circulate your papers i'm very lazy about it so you know i also should learn so basically you know circulate things on social media that are peer reviewed you know that have gone through the levels of criticism you know and also and also you know try to kind of you know write it up you know in a different version at a at a level that you know everybody can understand that your 8 year old nephew can understand as you know the people in dst you know the the outreach yeah. keep telling us you know absolutely. are you sure your 8 year old nephew or niece can understand this absolutely right. they don't, don't don't tell us this yeah yeah the point you mentioned because i am kind of reemphasizing this and that is an important point is that uh, science actually has to get democratized 
in the sense yeah. what you were mentioning is that the colleges and the schools and yes. other places because science is too good to be just left yeah, to yeah. elitist research institutions Absolutely. because Absolutely. tough matter can really we don't have too many we have so few uh, research institutions absolutely right absolutely yeah. right yeah. because soft matter can really fill in that particular gap i'm not telling everybody should do soft matter i mm-hmm. uh, we are not evangelist <laughs> in so so no, to speak. i i agree yeah but the the uh, kind of uh, uh, motivation you can have and uh, the resources what you can gather to do soft matter experiments is actually very small. absolutely you do some profound work you know that is the amazing part of it right because right? oh definitely oh. you know i mean you can do all kinds of condensed matter by using soft materials because they being scaled up atoms you know you can pretty much look at i mean these are, there are of course approximations you know in certain cases but yeah you know it's it's a lovely way to to look at life you know biology you know one of the questions of biophysics is what is life can we make an artificial cell absolutely right so so very well put and it cure diseases yeah yeah and it also very nicely connects to let's say chemical engineering and so many yes. process engineering processes yes food manufacturing food processing as you mentioned oh, yeah. oil recovery you know i yeah. mean this thing about interfacial instabilities it's come from something as you know as distant as oil recovery and you know battery manufacturing and absolutely right absolutely. Yeah. lithium ion battery yeah yeah i i'm delighted you know to actually have this kind of conversation or uh, with respect to the areas of research which are very high end in terms of the conceptual uh, kind of uh, thought process and yet within the uh, kind of uh, uh, within the kind of reachable arena <laughs> where you can really go there and still do all this work Oh, yeah, because... you can actually I'm in a short time right because it's not resource intensive at all okay. so I, i really hope you know we don't uh, we don't miss out on that aspect that you know we do need you know to encourage a lot of and actually i mean soft matter has grown enormously no, because no. when i was a student which was in the end 90s you know you could count them on your little finger the number of people who were really you know leading soft matter research now when you go to any of these complex fluid symposia right i mean they are all over the news yeah right. they they're, they're like all over the place there are you know people popping out of walls which is nice mm-hmm. but uh, yeah but you know i think maybe you know together we need to make a slightly louder noise noise absolutely about our research because uh, yeah no no this is something also uh, you know there are very good initiatives for example ranjini is also co organizing a very nice symposium now which is coming up at icts uh, on on soft materials and there are so many good workshops and people also across the globe have realized that this goes very well with uh, very fundamental physics and very fundamental chemistry and biology to a large extent yeah. and, uh, uh, materials and uh, other kind of applications too so i i think uh, there is reasonably good future for soft matter research especially in india right where you can really do something within the uh, limited small budget. budget yeah exactly. yes so for instance because you did you know publicize my school i should also mention that you know we have these two outreach sessions also so there is one for school kids where you know professor shubha tiwari from amherst she will be uh, yeah. showing some beautiful flow experiments and experiments with uh, liquid crystals you know which is of course very interesting because that's what you know many of our displays are made of so we need to understand these things and so that is one this is for school uh, school kids you know for grades uh, 9 to 12 and Excellent. then there's also one copy with curiosity talk so this is a joint talk between the jawaharlal nehru planetarium bangalore and uh, icts where uh, there will be another talk you know on liquid crystals for a for an audience you know anybody can walk in one anyway and also we have two slightly more technical but very public lectures so one is by professor david nelson from harvard university mm-hmm. so he's been working on the statistical mechanics of mutilated sheets nice. and you know uh, so basically crumpled membranes and crumpled paper and uh, mutilated shells and professor in- uh, andrea liu will tell us in her other uh, mm-hmm. public lecture uh, how you can actually use uh, artificial intelligence to train materials Wonderful. So see you know, how interdisciplinary all this is. Yeah, and all I these mean, will be online. Just, all these talks. They will also be streamed online. Yes, we can share the link here. Yeah. We'll be sharing the link. I'll I'll share the link. Anyway. Yeah, it will all be live streamed. Yes. Yeah, 
that's see that is one of the important points i would want to also just uh, emphasize uh, ranjini is that the the fact that science has to become open source without mm-hmm. actually costing uh, either on the people who are doing science or people who are consuming that science. is so unfair right yeah yeah uh, because uh, see i can understand there is an economic reason for for things to yes, absolutely be yeah done but uh, the, for example there is unreasonable uh, kind of uh, uh, you know uh, dependency on very big journals where uh, uh, article processing charges have gone roof over the over the roof that is something which we should know. Yeah. bringing all kind of media for example pratidhwani is one kind of effort where everything actually is open source and free right. access as it should be right and they 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 are able to access to people like you who is doing cutting edge work and also is willing to actually humanize science you know that is something which we, we are very very happy about that uh, people like you are really so willing to come come on to this particular podcast and talk to us about it thank you for one <laughs> i i am having a lot of fun talking to you too so <laughs> uh, yeah. so ranjini uh, in we will get in you know, expand a little bit more and uh, understand what nandini uh, ranjini the person Uh, huh, okay no what are what are your kind of uh, interests outside science and uh, okay. what, uh, what well, are... person doesn't really have a lot of time because you know i have a teenager you know and uh, well i mean my 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 spouse and i you know we are always very busy so you know for instance you know we sometimes we meet once a month because we are traveling so yeah on a saturday or a sunday power knows i came 8 minutes late because you know i had to i had to get a leak in the kitchen fixed right so yeah so a lot goes in that and i only seem to have sundays for that and uh, otherwise you know i mean i i do research, sorry just for the listeners we are doing it online so ranjini is actually yes. logging in from her home <laughs> And, uh, yes after fixing at least you know fixing the leak somewhat yeah, yeah. so <laughs> yeah so yeah so if i get time you know i have been reading but you know i don't read as much as i can uh, i like reading non fiction so the book i'm reading right now is uh, the emperor of all maladies by siddharth mukherjee you know it's a biography on cancer i mean it's beautiful but you know for those of you who've read it you know it's like an encyclopedia right so i'm taking my time i i watch lots of movies you know and the- in theaters because that is something i really missed during the pandemic i was never a movie goer but the pandemic made me a movie goer so now i'm of course looking forward to oppenheimer i just bought the tickets before i spoke to you oh, because the okay. seats are filling up fast right I so know. i had my teenager pestering me so yeah i mean as you know there are these big movies coming out i'm sure i should try to kind of sneak a peek at those nice and uh, yeah the rest is really you know all uh, management you know management of the lab and you know management which is really nothing to do with academics but you know uh, management in the lab and management of uh, home is important Yeah. um for yeah. instance you know yeah how, sorry uh, ranjini how do you balance these things it's a, it's a challenge especially you see i uh, there is some kind of uh, uh, advantage being a male unfortunately in in indian society yeah. well i do have a very participative spouse but yeah. then you know i mean see but then i i am also a bit of a micromanager but i'm happy with being a micromanager so i don't know i mean you know, we've just kind of uh, again you know self assembled ourselves and things go on okay i get a lot of help you know so uh, i i have a lot of help at home you know in terms of you know people who are helping me out with house you know right. the management of the house right. and uh, yeah and i mean my daughter of course you know she's now 15 she's in 10th grade so i have to keep an eye on her yes, uh, yes. doesn't work because you know teenagers are far cleverer than their parents are but i still try and uh, but you know i, I also try my best to sometimes unsuccessfully not to be too critical about my own management skills mm mm-hmm. at home because you know i also tell myself that okay you know my job is not to do everything and you know my my job is also not to know everything or to do everything correctly absolutely absolutely yeah so this is something very important uh, because uh, how you look at the uh, the life itself very much depends on how you look at your work because uh, most of us uh, uh, have our lives kind of revolving around the work what we do yes so yes. i i also say the same thing for my spouse and uh, we have similar kind of you know stuff 
uh, where you'll have to really get deep into what you are doing and of course have some kind of an interaction yeah so you know i think that understanding is very important Absolutely. right and because my spouse is a physicist i mean i think he gets it and he likes experiments no. so you know it's always very nice because i can also tell him what i'm doing yeah. we have one paper together after that we never really work together but then that is nice and you know we understand so a lot of you know like home you know planning for the home actually happens on whatsapp mm. <laughs> including you know buying the ticket so you know because now he's a newton institute but then oh. you know my my daughter here you know she's kind of uh, uh, <laughs> hyperventilating that you know seats are filling up fast so then you know we had to like have this quick whatsapp chat and you know so yeah so yeah we do use social media for uh, planning certain things yeah it's wonderful wonderful <laughs> no, yeah. that's something which is also very interesting and important uh, because uh, the general notion especially outside the scientific research domain of scientists being secluded in their labs not interacting with people is no is a wrong notion right <laughs> because oh, no, labs absolutely. yeah uh, so many interesting people who do science and scientific research oh, absolutely you know and also for instance you know there are certain things so you know as you know um, there are all these you know in bangalore at least we are very lucky that there are all these outreach events that go on especially over the weekend so that's why i said i couldn't meet you yesterday yeah. because there is this icts rri math circle that is now going on nice. for you know uh, children who are talented in math Uh, and uh, so yesterday they had like this six and a half hour session actually it ran into seven hours wow. because uh, yeah because uh, uh, professor koshik basu from caltech uh, berkeley is here so he is uh, he is of course a physicist but he is you know big time into science education so he even you know teaches in schools high schools in san francisco so he is basically you know guiding the children along you know different yesterday uh, mm. different concepts in geometry but you know actually doing you know getting the you know getting a par- you know the locus of a parabola by folding paper and you know making a parabolic mirror you know by using mirrors real mirrors okay and a bulb and you know getting the light to focus and yeah so we are also working on that actually now he wants me to make a mirror uh, for focusing sound the idea is to melt a coin at the focus Mm-hmm. so these things keep me very busy on saturdays wonderful in fact see that probably is also a kind of you know rejuvenation of spirit no, absolutely is you know by the end of friday i'm kind of you know <laughs> i'm really tired but these things you know and there are also so many things in the well that's well you know you you there are so many things going on right but then you spend some time with these children who are so enthusiastic you know they're getting down to the you know getting down to the floor and you know measuring you know some trace of you know some wobbly you know cycle that somebody had so they have they were given this problem that you know so there was this track of a cycle you know that that cycle wheel and they had to figure out whether it was going uh, forward or backward but they actually had to you know use well complicated geometry geometric concepts to do it and you know they were doing it you know without you know they were doing it using the native intelligence which is so inspiring fantastic fantastic yeah we are also you know slotted in you know certain ways of thinking thinking absolutely absolutely yeah it's a very important and uh, very very uh, uh, crucial aspect of it also i should mention that that's one of the beauties about uh, in uh, uh, working in bangalore because there are so many nice avenues to really interface yes. rr ac icts icts yes. has come big on the, on the way they are projecting the science or, or to the public right. all, all open source you know that is something i want to reemphasize oh do, absolutely just and that's an important thing fantastic fantastic so uh, sanjeev we'll also want you to uh, give a very short overview of your uh, research and motivations in your mother tongue so that uh, this is actually a general thing what i request my guests because mm-hmm. as you probably are aware that uh the language of science need not be only in english because it's very important that we kind of you know broaden this horizon of uh making science accessible not only mm-hmm. in terms of the what we do but how also we communicate it so mm-hmm. i would request you to just kind of give us a kind of a short uh, uh, overview of what you do and your motivations in your mother tongue which is bengali i i as you mm-hmm. <laughs> yes it is yeah Amar, uh, I'm going to use some English words, though. Absolutely, absolutely. That's how actually 
most of the languages are, are spoken in india right there will always be some kind of <laughs> yeah, because and also yeah i mean yeah so <laughs> yeah so আমি পদার্থবিদ্যা নিয়ে কাজ করি কিন্তু আমি যে এরকম পদার্থবিদ্যা করি মানে সেটা বেশি মানে ওটা একটা মানে একটা ইন্টারসেকশন আর কি কেমিস্ট্রি ফিজিক্স বায়োলজি সব কিছু নিয়ে মানে আমরা মেটিরিয়ালস দেখি আমরা পদার্থ দেখি আমরা পদার্থ মানে কিভাবে ফ্লো করে কিভাবে ডিফর্ম করে মানে মানে আমি যদি একটা কিছু নিয়ে আমি যদি সেটাকে দুদিক থেকে টানি তাহলে সেটা কিভাবে মানে সেটা কিভাবে মানে তার ডাইনামিক্স কিভাবে হবে এই সবগুলো মানে আমরা দেখি আর কি তারপরে আর আমরা অনেকগুলো মানে অনেক রকম মানে আমরা আলো নিয়ে আমরা অনেক রকম আমরা টেকনিকও আমরা ডেভেলপ করেছি মানে আলো দিয়ে আমরা কিভাবে এই বস্তুগুলিকে মানে বুঝতে পারি আর কি তারপরে আমরা অনেক মানে বাইরে আমরা অনেক টক দিই যাতে বাচ্চারা বা আর একটু বড় যারা কলেজে পড়ে তাদের তারা যাতে পদার্থ বিদ্যাতে আসে আর তারা যাতে মানে হাতে হাতে করে কাজ করে আর কি মানে যাতে মানে ছোট ছোট এক্সপেরিমেন্ট তৈরি করে সেগুলো থেকে কিছু একটা মানে কোনো রেজাল্ট বার করে মানে বেসিক্যালি ওই কনসেপ্টটাকে যাতে আরো ভালো করে বুঝতে পারে আর কি কাজেই i wish i could do better <laughs> yeah that is something uh, uh, it will be uh, it will be wonderful to also go forward and then see how one can expand the that uh, mm. because most of the people in india are trilingual most of them that's are, true yeah minimum three languages easily yeah, it, it usually huh. is, that is great yeah. great so uh, ranjini i would also want you to just give us an overview uh, uh, as we kind of come towards the conclusion uh, in understanding uh, the the things what you are now trying to kind of uh, you know research on uh, especially your slightly more uh, broader and bigger picture version of what you want to do your future directions in what way you would want your lab and also your outreach activities and other things right yeah an overview that will be nice sure yeah so um see right now we are basically you know we we are we worked on a broad range of problems so far and right now you know sometimes we find that you know just going so broad you know you tend to miss out on the details so it is now the details that we are looking for so you know if you look at for instance uh, uh, colloidal work you know i've just been talking about suspensions and you know that oh you know these are these colloids in water but we never really looked at the water now we are looking at the water nice. you know and this is in the context of many different experiments mm-hmm. um, so you know like you so for instance there are some materials that swell up when you know in water one of them is actually something that you make pie some with no. sabuda you know so we are looking at that swelling we are looking at you know how you can change that swelling Nice. so you know this is it sounds like you know it sounds trivial but it is not, not and not. you know if you want something more fancy so like i told you we are uh, making holographic optical tweezers mm-hmm. okay and the one of the things that we want to do is you know we want to look at defect dynamics in you know suspension you know well in 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 colloidal matter Absolutely. okay uh we want to look at uh, we want to create optical vortices you mm-hmm. know so these are things that you know we never thought of doing earlier but now there are certain aspects that we want to study which are the slightly more interesting aspects of colloids you know which come from some asymmetry in reactions you know in their uh, you know asymmetry in the in the way they interact with you know the env- environment so mm-hmm. that is something they are doing that these are of course much more difficult experiments and then we also continue to make materials so you know we make these materials that can swell up where mm. temp- you know depending on the q of temperature mm. okay now we are trying to make materials that you know swell up differently nice. you see 
and you know swell up differently you know that have some very interesting swelling properties to basically tune the temperatures at which you know such so as you can see I'm, I'm very interested in in swelling these days we also are doing a lot of you know uh, so like i told you you know we've so far we've mainly used colloids as scaled up atoms mm-hmm. okay now we are looking at uh, well grains as even more scaled up atoms Right. and you know whereas you know there are some properties that are very interesting and are very similar to atoms in these systems there are also some that are different because essentially grains are different from atoms right we are also looking at those properties that you know what are the differences there in the, there are similarities yes they are very good model systems but now we are also focusing on those those differences wonderful so you are getting to the bottom of the details right now you know mm-hmm. uh, wow that's yeah. that's a very nice kind of overview and also there's a lot of interesting directions which can be further connected to other other things right it can also even go and connect uh, uh, to to mm-hmm. biology or as you mentioned oh absolutely yeah so biology is something i haven't quite really you know gotten into uh, but we do look at synthetic active systems which have been you know janus particles and now we have some better particles so right. yeah Wonderful. so we also try to mimic say you know how bacteria mm. run and tumble so that's actually also part of on coming i mean ongoing or well future work yeah even even the geology connection is very interesting oh, yes. yes it is it is we are lucky that clay is also colloidal yes yes <laughs> the yeah. clay itself actually is such a fascinating it's, it's a very versatile material yeah. yeah great great so ranjini i'm very delighted to 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 you know uh, spend this this particular podcast me too you know this is a very unusual sunday for me and and really nice yeah, thank I, you for thinking of me yeah, i should thank uh, ranjini you know because we we are recording this on a sunday morning <laughs> roughly now almost in the afternoon and uh, and I, she has been very kind enough to to you know uh, spend this particular time uh, on this podcast So Ranjini I am uh, very thankful to you again it has been it's a great pleasure all mine <laughs> yeah and uh, for the uh, listeners I am going to also link all the uh, links uh, all uh, references in the show notes uh, so that you actually can go and also further explore uh, various things what Ranjini has been working on I will be linking uh, uh, her web page and she's on Twitter and uh, uh, I'm very into yeah yeah and yeah. Uh, Uh, but you would be able to get an overview of the research they are doing through their website uh, so uh, i would i would strongly encourage uh, interested people to have a look at that particular part of this so thank you uh, ranjini once again and uh, Bye. This, yeah. yeah thank you so much for having me my pleasure this is uh, pratidwani where we try to humanize science